1964, communication theorist Ma Marshall McLuhan wrote, the medium is the message. But this refers to the how of what we consume being more informative than the what. Or in his own words, the content of a medium is a message that can be easily grasped. But the character of a medium is another message which can be easily overlooked. At the time, McLuhan was speaking primarily about the mediums of voice, print, radio, and television. But to McLuhan, a medium wasn't just a book or a TV show. It is any technology that extends our senses into new insights and awareness. But it's not much of an, a stretch to see that statement extended into today's world of the internet, social media, cell phones, smart TVs. But one important lesson that I took from studying McLuhan over the years was that he did not intend for his statement, the medium is the message, to be a static sign, ignored like a traffic light in Klaus. But to the contrary, he urged us to, to continually reflect on its meaning, usage, and application to our rapidly changing world. My name is Frank Blau, and I'm a data architect living here in Dorabira. And I'm here today to demystify using this idea when thinking about data architecture, the domain that my career has been based on. That is, the creation, storage, and retrieval of data, but not just to provide insight, but to provide actionable insight. So my first narrative is going to be a little about the mediums that we play in today. And I promise I'm not going to give you a long, boring lecture about data architecture, even though I probably could. But. So if we think of a business, there are transactions. That is, unique pieces of data that re represent something of value that happen. This could be something simple, such as purchasing a book or food or even just accessing educational content. But to store the relevant details of these transactions, the majority of use cases are built on relational databases. Where'd my slide go? There we go. That is, we create large tables of information that relate relevant data about customers to products and purchases. And these tables have unique keys that we use to relate them to each other. And in this pattern or narrative, we want to know what happened. And we need it to be accurate, timely, and available. Putting data into multiple related structured tables of data is the core of a relational database. Now, this is all well and good. Our business can function using this transactional model. But eventually, someone wants more insight. Say, for example, how much beer did we sell to males between the ages of 18 and 25 in Vorarlberg on the weekend? Spoiler alert, a lot. <laughs> But if your transactional database is large, these kinds of queries can be difficult to create, manage, and maintain. So two clever guys, Ralph Kimball and Bill Inman, developed the relational dimensional model, or star schema. That we organize relevant attributes of the data around the transactions themselves, so that mere mortals, or sometimes the marketing department, can interrogate this data and explore the insight. But to create this, we would typically create a nightly process where we extract data from the transactional system, transform it, and load it into the new dimensional models. But an important characteristic of both relational databases, transactional and dimensional, is that they're dependent on a schema or a structure that does not easily change over time. This is partially what allows them 
to be so reliably transactional, but it does come at the expense of some flexibility. But from just these two narratives, I kind of tricked you into learning a little bit about data architecture there. You can already hear the echoes of McLuhan's claim. As we've adapted our medium, the database architecture, to inform new messages, the needed actionable insight. But there are other data narratives. Think about a pressure sensor inside of a machine. While a nightly review of this process might be useful to someone trying to analyze the, what was happening, if the pressure data is being sent out from the sensor multiple or many, many times per second, then the usage of this data probably can't wait until the next day. Oops, we blew up the machine last night. It's, it might be actionable, but it's hardly a prudent use of the data. And while the relational database may excel, it's not a pun, uh, at managing tables of related data, it was not really designed to accommodate this high-speed data. So a different narrative or data architecture was needed. This led to the time series database, where very small records of typically just say a timestamp and a sensor value were stored so that data could be visualized and acted on in real time. Again, the data architecture, the medium, evolved to tell a different story, the message inside of our data. In this case, when did something happen? So this would all go along nicely if it weren't for the applications that we were writing to use this information. For these ap applications, it required a lot of complex access methods to retrieve something as simple as, tell me everything you know about this customer, regardless of where it came from. This would mean the ability to not just render the orderly relational data, but also sometimes the messy and unstructured data like phone logs, web pages, or even binary data like audio and video. For these patterns, a document model was developed. This stored relevant data about a customer, for example, into a document with the ability to append it as new sources of information became available. And document databases come with massive scalability, including the possibility to manage millions of records while still providing real-time access to their content. But also important in a document database is that the structure is only optionally enforced, giving them a lot of flexibility with regards to growth and usage. Again, the medium of the data architecture, a document, informs the message, show me all the relevant data in one place. This next medium gets a little bit weird. It comes from the world of linguistics and semantics, which, interestingly, Marshall McLuhan spent a lot of time in his career. These are called Resource Data Framework, or RDF triples. What is a triple? Well, if you think of a fact in the data, Frank Blau was born in Santa Barbara, California as having three components. A subject, Frank Blau, a predicate, was born in, and an object, Santa Barbara, California. While these components may seem relatively simple, it quickly becomes apparent that just about everything we can describe in data could also fit this pattern. If you take the time, to parse it out. For example, TEDx22 takes place in Dornburn, Austria. Frank Blau lives in Dornburn, Austria. But what distinguishes this pattern from the others is that now the relationship takes place in, lives in currently, between things, has meaning by itself. Importantly, you know this from reading the triple the exact meaning. 
By contrast, in a relational database, I would have to explicitly create an attribute that represented the place this person was born. And you would have to know what the relationship meant by maybe looking at multiple tables across the entire relational database. But also imagine that your person or system that's responsible for putting the data into or updating the data in the database. They would have to know what format it had to be in, where it was. They would have to find it and insert it or update it. And the existence of an attribute tells you nothing about the usage or origin of that value. With a triple, the content is self-contained and self-evident. You just read it without having to know anything about it in advance. But another cool thing about triples is that there are millions of examples of triples that are available for use today. One example is the DBpedia database, where they've taken the entire fact set contained in the Wikipedia system and turned them into triples. This means if I want to know, for example, who all the people born in a place with a particular climate are, I can use the DBpedia triples for city, has climate, is always sunny. To match the city of Santa Barbara in my database of triples to aggregate information about the people that have been born there. But once we start identifying and collecting these semantic triples at scale, we need a way to store and access them as we do the relational document and time series data content. This powerful model of triple storage is called a graph database. And while it is a topic for a much longer, probably a little more boring speech, think of a graph database as a way of putting all your RDF triples into a model that can leverage their interconnected insight. Examples of graph data being used today include things like LinkedIn, where you can see not just someone you know, but you can even find people you might want to know. Or Facebook, where it is not just your friends that have value, but maybe the friends of your friends, or the friends of your friends of your friends, who share a common interest, whether it's social, music, education. But the easiest way that I like to think of it is that graph databases are capable of not just telling you what and when you know something. They're capable of telling you how you know it, too. And it is this insight that sets this medium apart from the earlier models that we discussed. So, now you've been told about some interesting mediums and their messages. But how can you leverage this information in your business and your life? Well, as you probably realize, it is a rare business that has only one use model for data. Most businesses, businesses have at least more than one of these sources of insight. You may, for example, have a relational CRM application, dimensional data warehouse, DevOps logs in time series databases, and application document interfaces all over the place. Considering these forms together is what we call a multi-model database. And if we are truly to bring to life the wisdom of Marshall McLuhan's statement that the medium is the message, then we should start with acknowledging the obvious premise that our multi-model lives require multi-model solutions if we're to represent them accurately. Now, the good news is this is a fairly mature marketplace for both open source and commercial solutions to create these multi-model platforms. But before you choose one, and it may quickly get very technical, there is still an important place for asking the basic question of what is the message or narrative that I am seeking and what models uncover it best. And asking it of your business users 
not just the technical nerds like me, even though I love to talk about it. <laughs> Ask where in your business and data management strategy you want to illuminate these narratives and leverage a multi-model architecture using already available tools and platforms to gather these stories together. We've talked about relational, dimensional, document, time series, and graph database architectures, and how they each have their own narrative message, which is derived from their form, not just from their content. And this evolution from schema-bound transactional systems to more flexible, semantic-based approaches will be an important trend in the coming years. In particular, the ability to have interoperable systems across multiple models will provide a significant competitive advantage to those businesses that can make it happen. This multi-model approach is also, I believe, the future of my career and enterprise data architecture. But exploration of what mediums or models are best suited for your story starts with asking. What message or narrative am I trying to learn or communicate? And plumbing together those mediums to enable the discovery of the actionable insight within them. This will enable not just recognized content to be leveraged, but also the value of the underlying structure and its importance to the design and adoption of a meaningful data architecture, capable of informing your business across multiple models and use cases, but also one that takes advantage of Marshall McLuhan's approach to investigating the claim that the medium is the message. Thank you.